Medina used to be called Yathrib, and in time it came to be known as Medina to Rasul, the city of the Prophet. And after that, it got shortened to just saying the city Medina. However, the Prophet did not like the title of Yathrib or Medina. He preferred the title of Taaba or Taiba, meaning the pleasant place. And that is why until today, in and around Medina, most places, most hotel names are called Taaba or Taiba in various spellings. The Prophet's household, the Ahlul Bayt, have said, had we not been forced out of Taaba, we would have preferred to remain in it throughout our lifetime. So there was an emotional attachment to Taaba of the Prophet and his household. Let us look at the sanctity of the inner chamber itself. The inner chamber is the home and the shrine and the room of the Prophet and the original area of the mosque that was built. There are ten items which make this area very sanctiful. The first itself is the shrine of the Prophet is within this area. Second, within this area is the strip of paradise. This is where there is a little piece of land between the shrine of the Prophet and the pulpit within the inner chamber where it is said, if you recite prayers in that area, you feel the contentment and the tranquility of paradise. Three, the inner chamber was the destination of the Archangel Gabriel Jibrail. He used to come into this inner chamber, either in the room of the Prophet or in that mosque itself to send revelations and talk to the Prophet. Four, the inner chamber is the home of the group of five, the Panjatan, the Prophet himself, Imam Ali, Lady Fatima, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. Five, it is also the venue of the event of the blanket. Hadith Kisa event occurred in a chamber in the room of Lady Fatima. Six, most of the scribes of Quran was done in this inner chamber. Seven, it is here in the inner chamber where the angels circumambulate the shrine of the Prophet non-stop. Eight, the inner chamber was the first seat of office, the first headquarters of the first ever Islamic government. It is from here that most of the policies of the government were performed. Nine, the inner chamber is also a place where many ahadith narrations were said. And ten, such is its holiness and loftiness that the Prophet said, one unit of salah offered in the Prophet's mosque has an equivalence of a blessings of a thousand units. Therefore, the sanctity of the inner chamber is indeed great. The Prophet himself has said, when you come for Hajj or for Umrah, come and visit me. Then your Hajj or Umrah is complete. And that is why when we've come for Hajj, either before Hajj or after Hajj, the twin visitation of Medina and Makkah makes the complete Hajj. It doesn't matter whether we come to Medina first and then go to Makkah, or whether we go to Makkah first and then come to Medina. It is the twin visitations that completes the Hajj or the Umrah. Let us now take an overview of the inner chamber itself. When the Prophet was in the outskirts of Yasrib, at a place called Kuba, which is about six kilometers away, people had lined up from Kuba right up to the center of Yasrib to welcome the Prophet. And when the Prophet entered the city of Yasrib, he said, wherever my camel stops is where we will build our mosque. And around the mosque will be built rooms for me, for my family and my companions. And the camel stopped at exactly the spot where we now see where the inner chamber is. It used to be a land belonging to two orphan boys, Sahal and Suhail. The Prophet bought the land from them and they started building the mosque. 
and he himself took part in that process itself. The mosque that we see today is a fantastic majestic structure. Originally it was nothing of the kind that we see today. The inner chamber, the original mosque, was simply a rectangular piece, 34 meters by 29 meters rectangle. And it was made not out of concrete, not out of marble that we see today. It was made out of clay bricks. The soil of Taba was used, mixed with water, and this was then dried in the sun. So it was baked in the sun when it was dry as a brick, that is what it was used. And it was made to a height of about 2.5 meters. Initially it was an open rectangle with no roofs. But as it used to rain quite often, a roof had to be put on. Roof not of the kind that we see today. The roof at the time was simply made out of columns and rafters. The columns in the rectangular part was the trunks out of the palm trees. So there were various trunks placed within the inner chamber, within that rectangle. And the rafters were really branches and trunks of the palm tree. And the covering was the leaves of the palm tree. So it was a very basic structure. The columns and the pillars that we see today are made out of concrete and marble. The roof is made out of reinforced concrete and also the whole structure is made out of reinforced concrete. At the time therefore we need to remember it was basic material, clay bricks, trunk trees as columns and pillars and leaves was used as the coverings. And once this first rectangular mosque was built, around it the rooms of the Prophet and his family and the companions was built. When this first rectangle was built, the Qibla was towards the north side, towards the Masjid al-Aqsa, which is in Jerusalem. It was after 16 months that the Qibla was changed towards the Kaaba, which is the south side. Therefore, in the first 16 months, this rectangular bit had the Qibla towards Masjid al-Aqsa. So now as we enter the mosque the, where the Kaaba is now, it was almost diametrically opposite to the north side towards the Jerusalem, towards Masjid al-Aqsa. And that is where the Prophet used to lead his prayers from. The original mosque had three doors, one to the left, one to the right, and the main entrance was towards the Kaaba side at the time in the first 16 months. When the Kaaba was changed, the two doors on the left and the right were remained where they were, but the main entrance was now moved from the Kaaba side to the Masjid al-Aqsa side towards the Jerusalem side. So the Kaaba side now became where the Qibla is, and that is where the Prophet used to lead his prayers from. The two doors there, before Qibla change and after Qibla change, it's called, one is called the door of Jibrail and one is called the door of Rahmah. Those doors by those names are there until today and we look at those a bit later on. In the inner chamber, until today, there is a raised platform. This is a platform which is next to the pulpit, next to the member. The platform, the height today is 2.5 meters. It's exactly the same height that was in the original walls of the Mosque of the Prophet. At that time there was no platform, there was a tree trunk there. And the Prophet called on to Bilal to call out the Azan. And Bilal used to climb this 2.5 meter tree trunk and when he was on top he used to call out. At that position exactly where it was that tree trunk is now replaced by a platform which is what we now see. There is also the pulpit and the member today. That wasn't there in the first few years when the mosque was built. Where the Prophet used to lead the prayers, next to it, on its right, there was a tree trunk there. And the Prophet used to lean against this tree trunk to give the sermons 
and talk to the people. It is not known exactly when the first member was built, but the consensus in the literature, it was in about 8 Hijra. This is when now a lot more people used to come to the mosque. So the companions told the Prophet, let us build a platform for you, a member. And so the wood from the trunk trees was used, and that was now placed where the member is placed today. So where we see the location of the member today, it's exactly the same location that the first member was and the Prophet used to sit. The first member was a simple construction of wood made out of three steps. And the Prophet used to sit on the top step so he could be seen by the people and could be heard clearly. Since then, there have been many replacements for this member. The first replacement was the time during the time of Muawiyah in 50 Hijra, about 7th century AD. He had built another member of nine steps. After that first member, there were other seven members that were replaced until the year 888 Hijra, in the early 1500 AD. The king from Egypt called Katabai, King Katabai renovated and built a beautiful member which was made out of marble. And he sent this member to be put into the mosque of the Prophet. So Muawiyah's member, which was there from the year 50 Hijra, after about seven different members, came the member of King Katabai. And that remained in the spot where it is now for the next hundred years. In 998 Hijra, early 16th century AD, King Sultan Murad from Turkey, he built another member of a beautiful structure made of marble and he sent it to replace the member of King Katabai. So today what we see in the Prophet's mosque is the member that was built by King Sultan Murad in the year 998 Hijra, early 15th century. Yes, there have been renovations, there have been cleaning and there have been various things done to the member. But the structure and the material of the member is the same as it is today. The member that was there before, which was sent by King Katabai, was then moved from the Prophet's mosque and it is now placed in the mosque of Cuba. So the member that we see in Cuba, it was the member that was sent by King Katabay in the year 888 Hijra. In the inner mosque in the time of the Prophet, there used to be a platform called Sufa. In the first 16 months, it was on the Kaaba side because Qibla was on the Masjid al-Aqsa side. After 16 months, that side was broken and the Sufa was built on Masjid al-Aqsa side because the Qibla was now on the Kaaba side. So the Sufa was always on the back side of the Qibla. And this is where the travelers who used to come to Yasrib, or the needy and the poor ones, they used to use this uh, platform to sleep overnight and have their breakfast in the morning. So in today's language, it was what we would now call bed and breakfast. But the Prophet always used to make a point. Every morning, he would go and meet these people of the Sufa, and he would narrate a hadith to them, and he would talk to them. But over time, that Sufa platform was demolished, and today, we do not see that Sufa. We do see a bench, a raised platform, but that is not the Sufa. This raised platform was built well after the time of the Prophet in the year 577 Hijra. And it was built by the Turkish king called King Nuruddin Zanki. He built this rectangular enclosure, a platform, not for the travelers and the needy ones, but it was built for the workers and the people who worked in the mosque. So they used to come and rest in this enclosure. This enclosure is there until today. When we come from the side of the door of Jibra'il, as you come in towards your right, as you come in, we see the raised platform there. And we find pilgrims also trying to get into this enclosure to say the prayers. 
and that was the enclosure that was built by King Zanki. In the inner chambers there are various pillars, what used to be tree trunks. In time these tree trunks were replaced by columns made out of concrete and marble and the majestic marbles that we see today. There are three kinds of pillars in the inner chamber that we see. There are two pillars that we do not see at all because they are inside the rooms. There are three pillars which we half see because half are in the rooms and half are in the inner chamber of the mosque. And there are other pillars that we see fully inside the mosque itself. Let us first look at the two pillars which are inside the rooms which we do not see. The first pillar is called the Tahajjud pillar. Tahajjud meaning the Salatul Tahajjud, Salatul Layl. The Prophet used to say his Tahajjud prayers on the back side of the Lady Fatima's mosque. And where he used to say his prayers, in front of him there was a pillar. That pillar is now enclosed in the room of Lady Fatima, so we do not see it. The second pillar is called the Pillar of Jibra'il. This pillar is now inside the room of the Prophet, which we do not see. The Prophet used to enter through the door of Jibra'il, which is now part of Lady Fatima's room, and then he used to go and converse with the Prophet with his revelations in the Prophet's room, and there used to be a tree trunk there, which is now called the Pillar of Jibra'il. So these are the two pillars that we do not see. There are three pillars which we half see in the inner chamber. The first one is called the pillar of delegation. As we now enter the inner chamber and face the Qibla, on the left side would be the rooms of the Prophet and the house of Lady Fatima. In that wall of Lady Fatima's house, there is a pillar there, half inside Lady Fatima's house and half in the inner chamber. This is the pillar of delegation. So whenever visitors came to visit the Prophet, they would use the main entrance to the north side, which is the side of Masjid al-Aqsa, and where they used to enter from the main entrance, the Qibla was in the front, they used to wait around this area on the left side, behind, next to this pillar. So this is why it's called the pillar of the delegation. The visitors would come and if the prophet was tied, he, he was tied up or he was busy, the visitors would wait here and then they would come and talk to the prophet. Further down this wall is the pillar, what is now called the pillar of security or the security guard. This pillar, half of it is now in the prophet's room and half of it is in the inner chamber. It is called the guarding pillar or the security pillar because this is where Imam Ali used to stand guard whenever the Prophet used to sleep. The third pillar down the wall is called the resting pillar. This pillar again, half of it is in the Prophet's room where the shrine of the Prophet now is and half is in the inner chamber. Whenever the Prophet was in the inner chamber and he wanted to rest, he would come and lean against this pillar and that is why it's now called the resting pillar. There are other pillars in the inner chamber. We will look at three pillars which have particular importance. And these are pillars which can be fully seen. One pillar is called the pillar or the column of Hanana, the yearning pillar. This pillar is in line with the pillar of the resting and it is next to what is now the mihrab of the Prophet. We see a little niche, a little alcove, a recess in the wall. On the right side is now a pillar. There used to be a tree trunk there. So whenever after the Prophet had led the prayers from the spot, he would step there what used to be his left, what is now on the right as we look at the Qibla, and it, he used to lean against that tree trunk to give the sermons. But when he used to lean there to give the sermons that tree trunk, when the member was built, he now left the tree trunk and used to sit on the member. When he did that the first time, miraculously, the tree trunk started to make a noise and started complaining. 
And the noise it used to make was the noise like a baby camel, which used to go, ya na na. And that is why that trunk is called the Hanana trunk, or now the Hanana column, or the Hanana pillar. Because the tree was yearning, that's why it's called the yearning pillar. It was yearning for the company of the Prophet. When it started crying out the first time, the Prophet stepped down from the member and touched the tree and spoke to the tree and said, do not cry anymore, for you will have my company in paradise. And after that, the tree kept quiet. And that is why today the pilgrims would go near the trunk and offer prayers in the hope that we will also be in the company of the Prophet in paradise. There is another pillar there called the pillar of Aisha. During the time of the Prophet, he told Lady Aisha that there is a particular spot in the mosque which has got a lot of blessings. I'm afraid if I were to show this spot to the people today, they will all be rushing and saying their prayers there. Because the Prophet used to lead the prayers from the front, where the mihrab now is. But it is reported there are times he also used to lead the prayers from this spot near to where the column of Aisha is today. After the death of the Prophet, Lady Aisha made it known to the people where this spot is. And that is why until today, when the pilgrims go, they gather around this pillar to offer the prayers because this is where the Prophet has said it has got a spot where prayers will be offered with the most blessings. There is also a third pillar next to the pillar of the resting pillar, which is called the pillar of Tawbah, the pillar of repentance. Sometimes it's also called the pillar of Abu Lubaba, named after the person Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba was a convert from the Oz tribe during the time of the Prophet. During the time of the Prophet, there was a campaign going on between the Muslims and the Quraysa tribe of the Jews who were the locals in the city of Yasrib in Taba. And the campaign went on so much that the Prophet now in the inner mosque had a policy on how to go and stop these uh, incursions from the people of Quraysa. Abu Lubaba was present in this campaigning and he was present when this policy was being formulated. So the Quraysa tribe now came to Abu Lubaba. He says, look Abu Lubaba, you've got your family living in our area. What is it that the government of the Prophet has decided against? So Abu Lubaba gave away the secret of the military campaign against the Quraysa. Once the secret was given, Abu Lubaba realized his mistake and he started feeling sorry. So when he came back to the inner chamber, he came to this tree trunk as it was at the time and he tied himself to it. And he told his sister Safiya, untie me only for comfort breaks and when there is time for salah breaks. And it is in the same inner chamber that the Prophet used to visit almost every hour in that mosque and literally next door was his room. But Abu Lubaba chose to ask for forgiveness from Allah directly by tying himself around this tree. And this went on for nine days. The Prophet kept quiet. On the ninth day, when the Prophet was in his room with Umm Salma, a revelation came to the Prophet, and it is recorded in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 64 in which Allah is now telling the Prophet, if those who have been unjust to themselves, if they had come to you, the Prophet, and you, the Prophet, asked Allah for forgiveness on their behalf, they would have surely found Allah most forgiving. 
So when the Prophet got this revelation, he came to Abu Lubaba and told him, Allah has now forgiven you. And he told Abu Lubaba, Allah has said, if you had come through me, and if I would have asked forgiveness on your behalf, you would have been forgiven a lot earlier. This is the wassul, this is intercession, right there in the inner chamber. And that pillar is there until today. So the wassul exists, it has been proven by this verse in the Quran. And that pillar, the column, is a stark reminder today of the existence and the surety of the intercession. And that is why pilgrims until today, when they come to this side, they come to this pillar of repentance and they say the prayers there. Through the intercession of the Holy Prophet to ask Allah for forgiveness. Yeah.